great. Well, we've uh, we've done uh, we spent a lot of time on the subject of the Holy Spirit. We've looked on who is the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does, and how do we receive the Holy Spirit. Um, there's two uh, other, well, three big themes I want still to look at. One is um, the, the types and figures of the baptism in the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, and I'll come to those tonight. Uh, and then I also want to look at the ministry of the Spirit, because uh, Paul claimed to be a minister of the Holy Spirit, and that was the heart of his ministry and the heart of a new covenant ministry. So new covenant ministry leads people to receive the work of the Holy Spirit as we've described it. And we can see how uh, that ministry takes place. We can look at it in the way Paul describes it, but we can also see it in the way Jesus ministered the Holy Spirit. And I, I need to look at that. We obviously won't get to all these subjects tonight. And then of course, we have to look at the wonderful subject of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and because the Bible is quite clear that there are many gifts of the Holy Spirit with which we can share the gospel, spread the power of Christ. We are the body of Christ. We are the continuation of the incarnation. <laughs> That's a huge claim. But we are the continuation. We are the hands uh, that touch the world. We are the mouth that speaks to the world, but it's Christ who speaks through us, Christ who touches the world through us. All the gifts of the Spirit are simply Christ touching the world. That's why there are more than nine, and there are more. if you can find more there, maybe we'll find 10, 15, 20. But no matter how many gifts of the Holy Spirit you find in the Bible, there's always more, because it's just the manifestation of Christ to people in need and uh, well so let's then go to this subject of types of the baptism with the holy spirit in the old testament i have identified eight eight miracles that took place i say miracles but things that took place with water it's very interesting by the way to think what miracles are some people say, say are miracles breaking the, the natural order of things? Are they breaking the, the laws of nature? Miracles are not breaking the laws of nature. The laws of nature around us are broken. And what happens is when, when there's healing, it's a restoration to a world that is <laughs> that precedes all this broken world. It, it's, the, it's sin and death and darkness around us that is broken. And when and Christ demonstrates, if you like, a higher law, but a purer law and the original law. And that's how he's bringing things back. We live in a broken, fallen world. And no, he's not breaking the laws of nature. He's he's restoring them when he heals people. <laughs> it's a beautiful, wonderful truth. Now, um, so um, I've said eight miracles through water. They're not all uh, directly. Um, specifically showing miracles there's one or two that are more um, simply like an anointing we'll come to them that what are these eight well let me tell you what the eight are then we'll look at what we learn from them the first one the first miracle of water is the creation of the world it says in genesis chapter one verse one that that the waters covered the earth and the earth rose out of a baptism so there was a baptism in the original creation and god created the world when he spoke uh, the, the the earth on the third day rose out of the waters third day resurrection the earth rose up out of the waters all kinds of interesting things that are there in that first account the the second one is noah's flood and we had a fairly thorough examination of that some months ago many months ago when we were there in genesis uh, and in the in the flood of noah 
the earth was returned to the original state of everything when God created. Uh, so those two are very similar. Uh, it was like a new creation taking place through the flood of Noah. And in both cases, you have the whole earth covered with water, uh, an absolute baptism of immersion of the whole earth. Only God could do that. The third is the crossing of the Red Sea, the dividing of the Red Sea. The fourth is the labor of the priests. The fifth is the crossing of Jordan when under, with the, under um, Joshua. The, the, that's the fifth. The sixth is the anointing of Elisha at Jordan when Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan River when it was stopped flowing and they were able to cross over. The seventh is the baptism of Naaman, the Syrian in the Jordan. And the eighth is Jonah, who was thrown into the sea, had three days in the sea. He was also in a, in a whale, but he was in the sea. And that is specifically referred to as a sign and the sign of the prophet Jonah, which is prefiguring the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And, um, uh, and the miracle that happened in Jonah. So there we have eight types of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. And what we're going to see is we're not going to go into each chapter in great detail. We're actually going to kind of summarize the kind of things they teach um, so that we otherwise we would be each one would be a, 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 an evening on its own. Um, but we're going to just see the, the kind of thing that is being communicated. And what you see if it, as a general principle in explaining these eight types of baptism, um, you have some, some are talking about what is made, what is done positively, and some are talking about what is done destructively, negatively. And the sum picture is that you have in the work of the Holy Spirit a destructive element, destroying what is wrong, and a constructive element, creating what is beautiful and imparting wonderful, beautiful qualities. So let's, let's look at them. Let's go through them in the order I've given them to you. And the first one is, of course, the creation. Um, and this is, remember what we're talking about. We're talking about these as types. So we know that in the baptism in the Holy Spirit, there is the, the great work of creation, making something in, that was not there before. This is a tremendous blessing to realize that the qualities God requires of me, he will give me. Um, he won't ask me to do something I, I, I am, is, are impossible for me. It may be impossible for me to think that I could do them, but God says, I'm going to create in you that which will do what I say. I'm going to create a new man in you. And the Bible speaks of that Jesus created in himself one new man and uh, produces a quality and a dimension in our lives that did not exist before. It's one thing to think of our eyes being healed. It's another thing to think of our eyes being made with a different power of sight. Um, I, I can't remember what, what uh, um, spectrum of light the eagle can see. Somebody will uh, no, it's um, either infrared or ultraviolet light, I don't know. But there are elements of light that we can't see. We would need different eyes. And when we are, when God moves in us, he doesn't just heal us. He creates us anew with, with um, 
something that is uh, beautiful. And it's not just molding like you would a piece of clay. Because when God created in the beginning, he called by his word things into existence that were not there before. It's not molding. It is, it is the act of creation. That word creation is startling. Um, you, it was, there weren't, this is a little story, a parable. Uh, there was once uh, some scientists in the laboratory and they were saying, oh, we can make life in the laboratory. Of course, this is only a parable. It's never happened. Life has never been created in the laboratory. But they said, oh, we can, we, we can make life in the laboratory. And so God showed up and said, oh, I'd like to see this. Show me how you do it. And they reached out to take some clay. And God said, oh, no, you can't have that. I made that. That's mine. You make your own. <laughs> Pointing out that human beings can do all kinds of things with God's already created world, molding it and making it work. We can make nuclear power stations. We can do all kinds of things. But we, can't, we didn't invent that. We discovered it. God made it. And um, uh, so God calls things into existence that were not there. And that's the wonder of the creative act of God there in that original act in um, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Um, it's, it's in Ezekiel chapter 36 there's the promise of a new heart and God promises that that new heart will have such a character character it will obey it will be an obedient heart you will walk in my laws I will cause you to walk in my laws I'll give you a heart to walk in my laws and how wonderful is the promise of that which he creates then we come to Noah's flood and Noah's flood is about destruction. That's the great thing about Noah's flood, is destruction. If we remember what we said way back, we said that probably with the demonic influence, there was a corruption of the human race to such a degree, it's possible, and this is speculative, that Noah was the only man and his family were the only people left uncontaminated by the inter demonic interference on a physical level and uh, we have this word that comes in genesis chapter 6 verse 6 when god said he repented he regretted that he had made man that is a huge statement and we made a lot of it when we talked about it. But God said, I put a question mark over your right to exist as you are. And that's where repentance begins. Because it's the understanding given by God. There is something so fundamentally wrong with each human being. That God says that has to be destroyed. There are parts of our lives, things about us that cannot enter in to the new Jerusalem, into the new creation that God is going to prepare. There are things about us that must be destroyed. And if I won't allow God to destroy them in me, I will be myself uh, destroyed. I will be in the lake of fire and destruction because God says those things cannot be in my new creations. And uh, one of the uh, great things about that, the, 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 the flood of Noah, was the way it dealt with the utmost evil. I think the, uh, the Bible doesn't give us that much information about the conditions in, before the flood. There was violence everywhere. There was demonic activity on a dimension far greater than anything in the world today. And uh, sin had reached an absolutely obsessive level. It was so over, oh no, a great overwhelming uh, 
power of evil let loose in the world, which we don't see yet. Maybe, I guess we're going to see it as the time goes on, we're going to see this revealed again. But the point is that God was able to destroy that evil and save people through the flood of Noah. And uh, that's the, um, the great power of the flood. It's the, the answer of God. This baptism is, is an answer to the awful state of the human race. That's why the day of Pentecost is perhaps the most powerful day we could ever imagine. It's not more powerful than the cross, but it is the cross applied. The whole work of the Holy Spirit is the cross applied. The most powerful work that God ever did was the cross. But the, the application of it, the experience of that power was there in the, on the day of Pentecost. You shall receive power, said Jesus Christ. And... Um, um, so when Jesus died, the earth was not covered with water of, of destruction, like in the flood of Noah. But it was returned to that state of darkness in Genesis chapter one and darkness covered the, the deep. And so the, you have that moment on the cross when Jesus Christ returns everything back to that primal state where he says, I'm going to start again. And that's what we have in the book. This is a, these are huge, big truths. God is beginning again. And that's what the cross tells us. And that's what the work of the Holy Spirit is to begin again a new human race. Prophesied and now actually coming into existence. Um, and that's the flood of Noah. That's the second one. When you go to the subject of the red sea and this is this is um uh it's t it's we we're told in 1 corinthians chapter 10 that they were all baptized unto moses in the red sea and it tells us there all passed uh, all our fathers were under the cloud all passed through the sea all were baptized unto moses in the cloud and in the sea, and he uses the word baptism. It's not, um, it's not a, a slip of the tongue. It's not a mistake. It's absolutely right. He's talking about the great work of the Holy Spirit, and the and through the power of resurrection, um, and the crossing of the Red Sea. What was the great mark of the crossing of the Red Sea? It was to blot out the power of Pharaoh and all the armies of the Egyptians, and to set them free from the power of Satan, the power of the old man, the power of the world, and to, and to, to wipe out their past. And what I love in the great miracle of the Red Sea is I love to think of what it would be like if we were walking along the beach on the eastern shore of the Red Sea, and we were there 1450 BC, and we it was the we saw this group of of three million people. We met them, and we said to them, "Where have you come from? Where did you come from?" And they would point back to the sea, and they would say, "We came from there." And the point is, they would have had no footprints of their past. They wouldn't, they would, we would be able to agree with them because we would see no trace of where they'd come from. We would look upon them as if they were a, a, a nation of millions of people who had just landed out of, out of heaven and landed on the beach. Um, God, and God said he would create a nation in one day, and that's what he did. And the beauty of it is all that power of, of Pharaoh and all the world and all the things that are in the world, they were wiped out. And that, here again, we have the destruction, the destruction of our past life 
and the landing on a new shore and the beginning of a new, uh, a new way of doing things and a new journey. I notice the uh, goes on in 1 Corinthians 10 when it gives a commentary on the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, Paul warns the people not to think that that was the end. It wasn't, oh, you got through, you got, you got baptized with the Holy Spirit. There you are, you're all okay now, nothing go wrong. He says, no, he says in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, um, um, but with most of them, God was not well pleased for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. And these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And in chapter 10, he, he warns them and says, this is, you are equipped now, you are a new people, you have been set free from the past, now walk like a new people, live like a new people, walk like a people of joy, walk like a people of power and of faith and of love and holiness and go and inherit the land. Uh, they didn't because they started moaning and groaning and ended up going round and round in circles until God said, that's it, you're not going in. And they could have objected, said, yeah, but we, 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 we've, just, we've had a great big baptism. He said, yes, but you didn't walk in it. You didn't believe me. And you then see the vital importance, not only of receiving the blessings of God, but by those blessings, developing a walk of faith. I'm struck over and over again in, the, in, in my reading of the Bible that God is leading his people to faith. Um, I love that song. I'm not going to sing it to you. But I wish I could. I wish I was. A, I was. I wish I had a wonderful voice. But I am a new creation. No more in condemnation. Here in the grace of God, I stand. My heart is overflowing. My love just keeps on growing, and so on. But the point is, that's what he's talking about um, here in this this third miracle. We're free from the past. We're able to go on, and if they had, they would have learned things about the tabernacle and then gone straight into the promised land. We have a, we have a door open for us. I, I know that Jesus said, I am the door. And I love it that in the crossing of the Red Sea, Jesus was the door. A door of escape, a door out and a door in. And uh, the door that, G G when we think of Jesus as the door, we might think of him, oh yes, Jesus is the door. No, he is the door of escape. As I surrender to him and let him minister to me, he is the door of escape and the door of entrance in to the promised land, to the holy of holies, to intimate communion with Christ. He is the way, the door to get into these things. So we're not just talking about a door doctrinally, we're talking about a door in reality, something that I go through, someone, someone I go through to discover God and the power of God. Let's go to the fourth one. The fourth one is the priest's labor which is in exodus chapter 30 um, and uh, you can see the labor again it's manifest when jesus took a bowl of water and washed the disciples feet in the upper room that is very very significant because that is one of the moments when he he brought the whole teaching of the holy spirit to them and there is no doubt that in that labor was a critical work of the Holy Spirit, which is that the, 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 in the labor or the basin of water, you went through the altar in the tabernacle, then you came to the, water, the basin, it's the priests, of course. You came to the basin, you washed yourself, speaking again of the cleansing action of the Holy Spirit. But the point is that 
through the washing of the labor, you were empowered to be a priest. They had to wash. And it was for priesthood to be able to approach God. And uh, when I think of the work of the Holy Spirit, one of the greatest works of the Holy Spirit is the, um, the introduction to prayer, to priesthood. When we think of priesthood, it, the, the whole nation lived around the tabernacle, around the altar, the laver, the incense altar, and so on. But the key thing is that the priesthood, the prayer life, if you like, was the, the key to the health of the nation. Lose the connection with God, and you're like a, well, have you ever gone into a, a dark room, and there's a beautiful lamp stand in the corner, and you switch it on, and the bulb's gone? It's of no use. And if there is no priesthood, no prayer life, no intercession, no drawing near to God, then the light has gone out of the church. The church functions, feed, the, the inflowing of the, the oil of life and power is through the prayer life of the, the priesthood of believers. And we believe in the priesthood of all believers. We're not just a special group of us. We're all to be people who draw and pray, draw from the oil of the Holy Spirit. And we come every day. We, we don't consider ourselves to be um, uh, worthy of ourselves. We are made worthy by grace. And we come only by grace can we enter. Only by grace can we stand not through our human endeavor, but by the blood of the Lamb. And that modern chorus says, uh, um, somehow by grace alone I stand where even angels fear to tread. And when you think about the, the labor and the equipping to go in, the, the, the Holy Spirit equips us not just to go into the holy places, but the most holy place. When I think back to the laver as Jesus um, used the laver and washed their feet, we're going to look at some of the things he said another time. But I noticed that in, in John 13, he washed their feet and took them step by step over the next chapters, over that evening, into the very holy of holies in John 17. Complete oneness with God. And that's uh, the labor. That's the miracle of the labor. Um, <clears throat> the fifth one is the crossing of the Jordan in Joshua, the book of Joshua. And uh, the key word in that great miracle is the word cut off because they were the waters were cut off. The waters of the Jordan were cut off. It says, uh, very far from Adam. I like that phrase. <laughs> City called Adam, very far from Adam. It's the power of the Holy Spirit to loose me from the heredity of sin in Adam. The blood that flows in my spiritual veins is now the blood of Christ, not the blood of Adam. And as Oswald Chambers often put it, we now have a family likeness with Jesus Christ. And that's the key to that crossing of the Jordan, the cutting off of the old. But the wonderful thing then to see them coming through the waters of, of the Jordan into a victorious Christian life. You see the power of victory. Uh, when we talk about a victorious Christian life, some people think of it like a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Does it really exist? Yes, it really exists. Yes, there is a place of victory. It isn't an automatic pilot. It's a place of constant fellowship with Jesus, but it's not strained. It's not hard. It's all about a rest 
Joshua gave them rest of heart and they simply entered into that wonderful life of victory and went from, from victory unto victory in, under his leadership. The equivalent to the book of Joshua is the book of Acts. There they were, they came through the crossing of the Jordan. They came into that tremendous, uh, wonderful, uh, victorious life. And then they went on in the book of Acts from victory to victory. The book of Acts and the book of Joshua stand in, uh, in parallel. We can learn how the principles from the book of Joshua, how to live in, uh, in, in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We can learn that. But the book of Joshua is, if you like, the contrast to what happened in the book of Exodus. They got the same experience, but they didn't enter. They didn't take that power and develop a life of victory. They moaned, they groaned, they wouldn't believe God. They looked at their enemies, and so they, they fell at every hurdle. But the people of Joshua, uh, Joshua's day rose above every hurdle and every obstacle and overcame. It's a challenge to us to do the same. The crossing of the Jordan uh, is the, um, the next one as well, the anointing of Elisha at Jordan. Um, maybe this is too much detail tonight, and maybe some of these we ought to go through in some detail to explain, because maybe not everybody is familiar with these scriptures. But Elijah and Elisha, Elisha was the servant of Elijah, and Elisha received a double portion of Elijah's power because they went through the Jordan together. It's such a picture of the baptism in the spirit. Uh, it's there again. And uh, I, 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 we'll have to do that another time. I won't go into the detail of it now. It's simply that uh, if you count the miracles that Elisha did, he did 16 miracles. If you count the number that Elijah did, it was eight. <laughs> I don't think that's what he really meant uh, entirely by the double portion, but it's part of it, certainly part of it. The real meaning of double portion is to all to do with the extra power to care. Because when the firstborn receives a double portion, if I were, I'm not the firstborn in my father's house. Um, I'm, uh, I'm the thirdborn, actually. But if I was a Jewish boy and my bro older brother were the oldest brother, he would get, we were, we were, we were four siblings. And if it was divided, um, uh, uh, it would not be divided four ways. It would be divided five ways. And my brother would get a double portion and we'd all get one. But in addition to getting the double portion, he'd also get all the widows and orphans. And that's why he needed the double portion. He needed the, 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 the equipment to love and care for people. It wasn't just for power. It was to care. And I'm certain that uh, Elisha had more miracles for that reason because he loved and cared and that's what he wanted i want a double portion of your spirit the baptism of naaman in jordan i'm not going to spend time over that simply that he lost his leprosy we again we could go over that in detail uh, another time but he lost the sickness that was so uh, destroying his life and that's the whole point we lose the sickness of the power of sin there's a there's a power of god that gives us power of victory and he was made his flesh was made in the jordan river like the flesh of a newborn baby and before we go to the last one jonah let me just mention those uh, is it three miracles of the jordan the crossing of the jordan elijah and elisha at jordan and uh, Naaman at Jordan. When you look at those three miracles in the Jordan River, they happened in different, well, two places. Naaman was um, uh, baptized in the Jordan seven times. He was baptized in the Jordan River 
probably up near the Sea of Galilee, about not too far from the Sea of Galilee, in Samaria, that kind of area. Elijah and Elisha crossed the Jordan at exactly the same spot where uh, Joshua did, near Jericho. And Jesus himself was baptized near Jericho. I remember Ron Bailey speculating whether he would have loved it if Jesus had gone into the water from the east side of the Jordan River, been baptized and come out on the west side. I'm afraid I don't think that's quite accurate, but it's a nice thought. I like it. Let's just go finally then to Jonah. And uh, I love Jonah because uh, he so speaks to me about the need for God to change our attitude, our hearts. What was Jonah's problem? It was racism. He loved Israel. And when God said, go and preach in Nineveh, Jonah said, no. <laughs> He said, I'm not loving my enemies. And they were the enemies of Israel. And I'm sure Jonah had qualities that were great, but he didn't have the love of his enemies. In fact, although he did eventually get changed and he did reach out to his enemies, he still had, even at the very end, he still returned to those grudges. He still allowed racist thoughts to come up in his heart. But in the see God dealt with him and changed his heart so that he would be able to love his enemies what I get from Jonah is this this empowerment to go to the nations but that empowerment isn't just a a, a, a power again it's it's love because the great power that takes people into uh, other places is, is love. I've read two uh, um, biographies, uh, conversions of two Muslim. One was uh, 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 an advisor, a helper to Yasir Arafat. He was an Arafat man. And the other one was a man who was a Hamas terrorist. Very interesting books. And both of them were completely bowled over by the love of, of Christians for them and by the hatred of their own religion. And this, this fostering of hatred, they were just gripped by this love of God that crosses all barriers. And... Uh, that's the power of Jonah. Jonah needed a love that would love his enemies, and, and he didn't have it. Again, with Jonah, you can see that though he did get that change of heart, he didn't abide in it. And he wanted still to see, uh, he had these racist thoughts, oh, if only you could destroy them and all this, it was terrible. But I remember again what we're saying, the work of the Holy Spirit creates a potential, not the end. We're not robots by the Holy Spirit. We are co-workers. We have to learn to walk and work with the Holy Spirit and uh, to do the great work of God. So let's just sum up quite simply and say, the Holy Spirit comes to destroy, to destroy unbelief to destroy the flesh, to destroy the power of darkness in me, to set me free and land me on that shoreline with all my past wiped out, a new man. And I am challenged in my roots of my being to be the new man God has created me and to see all that wonderful power that the positive power the negative has gone and to walk in that new mind of christ put off putting off the old and putting on the new and walking in the power of christ let me pray and then we'll uh please 
do feel free to pray after this and uh, pray for Ukraine still. We're not uh, forgetting at any moment our brethren in Ukraine. Um, I believe that when people's backs are to the wall, they can cry out to God and experience God in, in ways that they would never have done. We mustn't forget that God knew this war would happen. This war hasn't happened without God's knowledge. He knew, he foreknew, and he will use it for his glory. Lord, I praise you. I praise you for the cross and for the resurrection and for the application of that in our lives through the work of the Holy Spirit. I praise you for the destructive fire that comes into it. It's a baptism of the spirit and of fire. Praise you for such a great work of God in us. Burn up the dross of base desire. Burn up sin. Burn up all kinds of things, attitudes. Jesus, I give myself upon this altar and create in us loving hearts, creating us power to pray, creating us the, the desire to do your will and love you. Jesus, we want to believe it and clothe ourselves with the new man. We are, we are a new creation by the power of the Spirit of God, by the grace that comes through the cross. And we pray for our brethren in Ukraine that they shall come into such a powerful experience of the cross and the Spirit that alongside all these terrible things happening, there shall be such a vein of gold and of glory coming through that shall shine for all eternity. Bless your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.